Hi everyone, in today's conversation with authors, we have Brian Staffley, the author behind Chronicle of the Unhewn Throne Trilogy, Skull Sworn, and the upcoming The Empire's Ruin. For those of you who don't know, Brian Staffley is one of my favorite authors of all time. I mean, just look at these books. I have all of them here. <laughs> and so this means a lot. This means a lot to me that I get to do this conversation with him. So please welcome Brian. Hi, Brian. Hi, Patrick. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. It's great yeah. to chat with you. Sort of in person, person-ish, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just to get things started, for newcomer to this video, uh, please tell us a bit about yourself and your books. So I write epic fantasy, uh, these big, big honking books that span continents and that have, you know, yeah, look at look at the size of that brute. Um, <laughs> they have, you know, you know, cast of many characters. Uh, the first trilogy begins with the Emperor's Blades and it follows three adult children of a murdered emperor. There's a, a monk, a special forces soldier and a politician. Um, and they are all uh, sort of working to, to to get to the bottom of this conspiracy, which turns out to be millennia old that led to the death of their father. Um, and even though they're all siblings, because they've been raised separately in very different traditions, they don't, and even though they're all ostensibly on the same side, they, they don't agree about a lot of things and about the way to approach this fight. So there's just as much discord and distrust in between them as there is between the three of them and the forces arrayed against them. Mm, yeah. And the Empire's Ruin takes place in the same world as the, the first trilogy. And yep. I'm sure that you get a lot of this question, and I myself get a lot of this question. Can new time readers uh, start from the Empire's Ruin or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so the answer is absolutely yes and okay. absolutely not. <laughs> so it, it really it has been fascinating to me because people like folks like you who have read the first trilogy, when you ask them this question, they're like, no way. You gotta get the whole backstory. You got so like this character right here on the cover of Empire's Ruin. That's Gwenna. She's one of the special forces people. Uh, she she's a character all through the first trilogy. And people like you, I think, rightly say, well, how are you? How are you gonna read Gwenna when you haven't when you don't know about her whole backstory? And, yeah. and everyone who's read the original trilogy agrees with that. Yeah. But a bunch of people now have read the Empire's Ruin who were new to my world. And every single one of them says, oh, yeah, Reed's great. I, I wasn't confused. I knew it was going on. I'm sure there's some Easter eggs in there for people, for longtime fans, but uh, I, I had no problem with it. So beats the shit out of me. I, I, <laughs> I want to write a book that would be rich for people who are fans of the original trilogy. That wasn't just something totally new. So there's there's a number of familiar faces in the Empire's Room, not just Gwenna. Um, but I also did want to write a book that would be an accessible entry point for new people and if I manage to do both of those things, I'm amazed. But it, it's sounding as though that's the case. <laughs> I think you really did it, though, because uh, I mean, for me, uh, new, uh, the one who have read all of your books and sure. uh, with newcomers, we cannot possibly agree on this because for us, we cannot imagine. We just cannot imagine the possibility of reading this without reading the first trilogy. But for newcomers, sure. I think it's really it's really possible. So yeah, yeah. the answer is. As Brian has said, it's absolutely yes and absolutely not. <laughs> so, so Patrick, here's a question for you along those lines. So yeah. I, I wrote, for people who are unfamiliar, I wrote this book. This is called Skull Sworn. Which uh, yeah, is a yeah. It's a standalone novel. It's sort of a prequel to the original trilogy. What order, leaving aside the Empire's Ruin, when would you recommend that people read Skull Sworn in relation to the original trilogy? Uh, for this one, I think it's free. Yeah. It's, it's uh, which one you prefer. Although uh, I do, yeah. I did read Skull Sworn after I read the first trilogy because uh, yeah. Pire, is that how you pronounce the name? Pire? I, I say Pire, but you know, I'm uh, flexible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Pire is a side character, right, in the first yeah. trilogy. And yeah. I, I'm always fascinated by Pierre because I like her character, but she doesn't get uh, featured enough, in my opinion. In oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. getting her standalone prequel was wow it's a bonus for me <laughs> but i think yeah. uh, because her her role in the first trilogy wasn't as big as that uh, maybe gwena gwena mm. is as a much larger ro uh, role compared to peter yeah and that, that, that's why i think it's okay to start from skull Sworn or the Emperor's blades yeah yeah i mean i sometimes told people they could read the original trilogy and then just put Skull Sworn in, in between a couple of the books. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, it's just like a little, 
a little palate cleanser because it's a kind of different a different kind of a book uh, yeah and you know this is your fifth novel right the, the yeah art. yeah and yeah. this uh, scarce one was published in 2017 so that's uh four years that's four yeah. years scarce one would you consider that this is the hardest book you ever wrote because <laughs> at the acknowledgement of this you mentioned that you wrote 300,000 words and you had to throw it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was not, my, not my finest moment. I'd written a whole book and it had been accepted. My editor said, great. And they sent me the check, of course sent me the check and it was headed off to the copy editor. And then my agent, Hannah Bowman, she's brilliant, but she called me at like, I don't know. I was in bed on a Friday night and she was like, okay. so Brian, your book is not good. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I knew, I knew that. I knew that somewhere in my heart and I just did not want to acknowledge it. I was, you know, it was like, okay. And, um, you know, so we had a long conversation that night about like, well, what are the ways to fix it? Can, you know, can we, can we add in a POV character or pull this out or change the order of events? And I mean, really the conclusion was, it's on it's it's just it's fucked it's unfixable right now um and so we went back to tour and said hey sorry about giving you that book and that it was bad and can we please have it back and we'll send you the money back and we'll give you a different one later on <laughs> and uh and they were very gracious about it. i mean everybody was was extremely gracious and forgiving and um so i just started again from scratch and there are there are elements of the empire's ruin that existed in the original book but it's really an entirely new it's an entirely new reimagined thing well, that, i mean that, i mean when it when it goes on a quest that's like the only thing that's the same between the two books <laughs> oh, wow damn that's crazy though Three hundred thousand words yeah yep it 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 but you know i really really did not want to put out a book that i wasn't proud of um right. you know it's it's it, it's such a vulnerable moment when you put a book into the world anyway even if you even if you think yes i did everything i could i did my very best and i'm proud of this there's going to be things later on where you're like crap i didn't i didn't mean to do that and oh you you know this this reviewer nailed it that's a mistake that's an oversight i wish i'd done that differently and i can't imagine having that experience with a book that i wasn't actually uh -huh. excited about proud of in the first place right uh, i mean that just seems so, so horrible so I, i'm i'm thrilled that we waited because this book I am legitimately excited about and I am legitimately proud of. And so I will forever be grateful to Hannah for that <laughs> conversation and, and for having the guts to do that. You know, she didn't have to do that. She's got a bunch of very successful authors. It's like more of a pain in the ass for her to, to talk to me about it, to talk to Tor about it, to go through that. She could have just let it slide through, but no. So I, you know, my hat is off to her for, for making that call. And I'm, I'm really yeah. pleased with what ended up resulting, but yeah, it took a while. It took a while to get here. <laughs> but I do agree though that this is your best work. Personally, I think it is your best work, but even you though- think huh? You think it's better than Skullsworn? Yeah, I didn't think that was possible because I was so obsessed with Skullsworn. I think, mm -hmm. you know, this, this is also a question for you because uh, Skullsworn used a first person POV, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the only book out of all your books that use first person POV. Would you say yeah. that that's easier or harder to write? Oh, it, it, uh, neither, just a different set of challenges. Um, so, you know, but interesting challenges. I was thrilled with the craft and technical challenges of writing in first person. One of which is there is going to be a disjunction between the voice of the narrator telling the story and the voice of the character experiencing the story. So mm -hmm. Pierre is experiencing the story when she's in her early 20s, right? Mm -hmm. So when she talks then, when she's talking to other people, she, she has one kind of voice, but she's relating the story to us significantly later. And so there's a disjunction between those two voices. And that becomes part of the opportunity is to play the voice of the narrator off the voice of the character. It's, it's, you know, it's almost like this polyphony between the two voices they're the same character, but they're also different because they're separated by a matter of, of decades. Yeah, um, and then another question, you know, another thing that comes up when you're writing a first person narrative, and a lot of people I think just ignore this, and I, I, I don't know how, but um, is in what setting is the person telling the story and to whom, 
right? You, you know, it's easy to write, you know, I, I got up and I found that there was an ogre in my bed and I was confused, blah, 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 blah. But like, eventually I think you have to pay the piper and make it clear where this voice is occurring, where it's taking place. And that was the thing that took me a long time to solve with Skull Sworn. Um, uh -huh. I mean, I, it, and it only becomes clear to the reader at the very, very, very end, who, who yeah. she's telling, who, who this story is for, right? Yeah. Because when you're writing in third person limited, which is what I do most of my book, all the rest of the books in, yeah. th there's just kind of an understanding that the story is for the reader. But when you have accepted the fiction of a first person voice, you've also taken on all the context of that voice. You know, mm -hmm. the voices don't just speak in a vacuum, it's not just like echoing in the shower or something. So, you know, figuring out, okay, who is Pierre talking to and why? And then having to go through the book again and making sure that the way she tells the story makes sense for the story that she's trying to tell and the person she's trying to tell it to, you know? So those are those are all challenges that don't exist in, in third person limited. Yeah, um, that's true, yeah. But then, but, you know, third person limited has, has other opportunities one of which is, you know, if you're writing in this sort of free and direct style, you have the chance to have the narrative perspective diverge. It's a little bit like the, the two narrators in a first person, but you can have the narrator's voice and perspective converge and diverge from the perspective of the characters. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes you are, you know, it's called psychic distance sometimes. Sometimes the psychic distance between the writer and the character is very small. So um, you could start a book um, written in third person limited, like, damn it, rain again. Um, and that's, you know, you know, Arya got out of bed and was angry that blah, 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 blah. That's uh, third person, but it's very tight. You're, you're, uh, almost, you're almost shading into first person. Whereas like great psychic distance is like on the morning of July the 17th in 1952, uh, you know, Reginald P. Watts rose from his bed and blah, 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 blah. And then yeah. your, your, your narrator is really creating a great distance. Ah, uh, yeah. The narrator and the character, and that distance is flexible, right? And and any any writer who's working in that is playing with that psychic distance, sometimes coming close, sometimes diverging, uh, and that's one of the great um, one of the great opportunities of that. And there are moments in any, you know, I'll take the the Wheel of Time because a lot of people have read that. But yeah. where Robert Jordan, he mostly operates at a pretty consistent psychic distance, but occasionally, sometimes at the end of a chapter, he'll pull way, way, way back and you get the sense that like, oh my God, we've yeah. been up close and personal. We've been like embedded with these characters, but yeah. now we're seeing it from like the perspective of a historian who's yeah. telling the story like a hundred years later, a thousand years later. And that I think is a really exciting opportunity for, for a writer. You know, all, all these different choices have burdens and opportunities so it's it's fun to to write a different a book in a different way and you know uh, in your books there is a lot of characters quite a lot of characters by the, by the fifth book especially there is so many characters and you know uh i think almost all of them were pretty distinctive they have a very distinctive mm -hmm. voice whether it's first person or third person they all have very have a very distinctive voice and uh there is this uh friend of mine her name is Esme. She wanted me to ask this question so much because she is very sure. curious. Which one is your favorite characters to write? Wh which single character is my favorite to write? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Pierre, Pierre was always a favorite from the original trilogy. Um, Pierre was just like, she just wrote herself. Um, and I also really enjoyed writing the flea in the original trilogy. The flea, the flea. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's, he's a... Uh, He's an old veteran special forces guy. Um, but there's, sec there's secondary, yeah, total badass. Um, yeah. There's <coughs> secondary characters and secondary characters are in a way easier to write because you're not getting into their head. Um, and so what, what happens is that you can have the character say something a little bit obscure or a little bit gnomic and the reader then just projects into the character all of their excitement and fantasy and you don't have to show what's actually going on under the hood right uh -huh. it's just uh peter can say like well this looks like a fun battle and you're like what what does she really think it's fun? I, I don't know and all the other characters are like does she really think this is going to be fun like we're all going to die um and and as you know as the writer you don't have to explain that and that's the strength of a character whose head you never get to be in they're just i think they're they're actually really fun but also 
kind of easy to write. I mean, easier than writing a POV character. Um, so like right, your point of view character, like writing Gwenna for this book, for yeah. instance, much, much harder. Cause Gwenna is herself, a, you know, as you know, a total badass kind yeah. of on the orbit of Lee, but she's, I don't think this is a huge spoiler because it happens in the first chapter, but she's like a broken badass in this book. You know, she messes up in the first chapter in a really bad way. And, um, and getting into the head of a character who is both probably one of the most capable characters in, in all the books, but is also very badly psychologically damaged yeah. is really hard. Like, what, what is she thinking about minute to minute, day to day? You know, how much of the time is she dwelling on this, this accident that led to the death of her troops? Um, yeah. What does that dwelling look like? Well, how does it feel? Um, you, you can't just sort of, if she was a secondary character, you could just put, put her in a corner and she would be she would be quiet and you'd know yeah. something. <laughs> right, and that's sort of easy. But if she's the main character, you gotta like get in there. You gotta get into her brain. And um, and then that gets, that gets a lot harder. <laughs> the stuff that Gwena, wow, the stuff that she went through in this book is pure suffering. It's a lot yeah. of suffering. And yeah. I did mention in my review that this book reminded me of The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson because uh, in a way, Gwena is uh, experiencing the same thing that the main character in The Way of Kings is experiencing. He's a, uh, the main character in The Way of Kings is very capable. He's a very capable warrior, but he's also very depressed of his, because of his actions in the past that, well, yep. not a spoiler, but caused a lot of damage. So Gwena is kind of experiencing the same thing. And I'm curious, does it ever depress you writing her POV? <laughs> well, you know, honestly, Gwena was like, she's in this book she was a little autobiographical for me like I you know it had been like a tough time writing you know like I told you writing this book and screwing it up the first time around um like I got divorced during this time period and it was just like you know not the easiest time in my life and so uh, Gwenna was instead of being making me depressed Gwenna was like I was like following her kind of out, out of this, you know, and and drawing on my own, some of my own stuff in writing her. Um, so yeah, no, Gwenna was, she was almost a help to me that more than a, more than a, more than baggage. Um, That's so cool. <laughs> that is so yeah, cool. Yeah. But it's hard, you know, it's really hard because I wanted to write like, a kick-ass rollicking quest book where like people go to undiscovered lands and they see crazy monsters and they have like abandoned city like I wanted all of the great quest stuff yeah and and then I have this character who's like anxious <laughs> and depressed yeah. like, I don't want to write I don't want to write a 300,000 word book about somebody who just sits in the brig and like mulls over her past actions but I do need to write this character and yeah. so we're trying to find a way to, to have my cake and eat it too, to have this, this fast paced propulsive quest story with all the exciting elements I wanted, but with this character at the center of it, it was, that was, that took some doing. I but, mean, the key, honestly, the key, the key to Gwenna, the, the thing, the, the thing that allowed it to work was rat. Um, yeah, yeah, I was about to mention that. <laughs> and, and, you know, rat didn't exist in the, in the old book. Uh, yeah. And I mean, if you think about where Gwenna is before she meets Rat, just think about her character arc to that point. It's like nothing has propelled her to do much. You know, she's just like, I don't know, I give up, right? Yeah. Um, and and so it's Rat that is the is the you know. I was, I really love I really love this kind of I don't know if this I don't I don't know if this is called troop or not, but basically the character who has lost all hope but then suddenly found something that kind of yeah. made the hope in this character even though almost everything is lost already it's yeah. i cannot get enough of that and re seeing Gwena trying her best to do that is amazing yeah. well, <laughs> and, and it's, it's absolutely a trope the idea of the hardened like disillusioned warrior who yeah. finds a kid who finds a kid right i mean that's yeah. every other alien right it's it's all over the place but it's all over the place because it's fucking real, right? Like I have a nine year old, I have a nine year old son, and I know a lot of people who have kids, and like the healing power of children and the way that like even when you for your own self, you're like, I screw it, I give up. Like if you have a if the, if the kid, if there's somebody relying on you, yeah, to, like that's 
powerful. So, you know, it's absolutely a trope. It's a trope that I'm fond of, but, and I think I'm fond of it because I, I just see it in real life. Like, uh, yeah, so, yeah. And there is also the contrast with this jerk of a character, a John Long Lamb John on. <laughs> okay, I'm curious. Is any of this character inspired by real people? No, no. no? Um, but I, I mean, he's, he's inspired, I think, by a type of person because he's, he's sort of a foil to Gwenna, I think, in that they're both commanders, they're both extremely capable. Mm. Um, they're both faced with failure and he's just a little bit more brittle, you know, like Gwenna, um, she's not like him, but she is like him in some ways. Um, but he's just, he, he's not quite flexible enough. He's not, not, as long as he's succeeding, he can, he can still excel. But when push comes to shove, he can't face his own failure. You know, Gwenna faces her failure. That's what she has to do. And, and when he faces his, I mean, I don't wanna have any spoilers, but yeah. his decisions when he faces his failure are poor. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's, he's not like inspired by somebody I know, but that, that type of person who is just, is brittle. Um, and, um, you know, I, shit, maybe he's inspired a little bit by me too. Like I, I like, you know, failure is, is tricky. Um, it, and so, <clears throat> I mean, in a way, I think all the characters you're, you're digging, you're rooting around in yourself for something, especially when you need to get into their heads and understand their emotional mindset. So yeah, that brittleness in Jonan is, I relate to that as well. Like I, you know, I messed up, so I'm just gonna burn it all down. Um, <laughs> right, kind of where, kind of where he is. Yeah, but he was, I, I like to have nuanced um, and complicated antagonists, but I also do like to have, I mean, it's fantasy. I like to have somebody that you can just really hate. Yeah, um, yeah. Right, like I, I, you know, I, I like, I like the gray area, and I like the people who are both good and evil, and all, and all that stuff. But sometimes you just want somebody that you just loathe. And, and we, um, we need a character like, like Jonon. We need a character like him in this book. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, um, and he I actually rehabilitated him a little bit because I had a friend who read a, an early draft of it, and he was like, you know, this guy's just such an asshole that it's oh. not plausible he would be in charge of anything. Like no one would put him. He, he is so unself-aware and okay. so just ludicrous. He's like, you don't have any respect for him at all, ever. And he's like, that makes him less interesting. So I actually, he used to be even worse. <laughs> oh and I tried, I, tried to, I tried to actually show, especially in the first half of the book, that even though there's a lot of loathsome things about him, you could see how he's a capable commander who, who would be respected by the people on his ship. Um, and, and respected more broadly in the Anurian Navy. Um, mm. And I thought that made it more, I, I thought that made his arc more interesting because if you take just a, a, a lousy guy and he's just <laughs> continues to be lousy, that's not that interesting. If you take somebody who might have been redeemed, then, then you have more ambiguity about what, yeah. what's going to happen. And so, yeah, he, he, he's had an interesting career in my mind, Jonah. <laughs> I see what you mean, though. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm really curious about uh, the inspiration behind your world. For example, uh, on one hand, there is no dragon, but we have giant hawks. And yeah, other than yeah. that, the world itself, the Anurian Empire and Do the city of Dombang, all of them kind of felt like Asian inspired to me. So, mm -hmm. for example, I don't know if this is wrong or not, but Dombang reminded me of the floating market in Thailand. Is that really the inspiration behind it? <laughs> Well, I, 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 there's no one-to-one -one anything in my books. I'm not writing, you know, historical fantasy, and I I don't have the the the, the background knowledge or anything to write and to say like, oh, okay, so this is from you know the Tang yeah. Dynasty, whatever. Yeah. That said, with with Anur in general, with the Anurian Empire, mm -hmm. in the back of my mind, when I have just broad questions about like. How, what's the population of the empire? Or like, what's the level of technological sophistication or something like that? I do think about the Tang Dynasty in China. <laughs> uh, uh, that is, that it is not, the Anur is not the Tang Dynasty. There's millions of differences from the way yeah. that they levy their lead. There's all kinds of differences, but, but it is a sort of just a touchstone um, and a reminder to myself that like, not to just go back to Europe again and again. So this is not, 
I, I, I would be very hesitant to say this is Asian fantasy. It's not, this is not Asia. Um, it's not trying to be like one step away from Asia, but it's very much trying not to be Europe either. It wants to be its own world. And so it was useful for me to have, um, yeah, just a different set of, of touchstones when I, when I was thinking about, about cities, about history, about scope, um, about currency, about industry, all those things. Um, and as, as I was telling you before we got on the call, I wrote the first draft of The Emperor's Blades while I was living in Asia. Yeah, <laughs> that's I have, okay. I have been in those floating markets. And so while Dombang isn't, you know, the, the desire to write Dombang that way was just that I thought that it would give me a lot of dramatic possibility. For people who haven't read the books, it's a city all of canals. Um, yeah. And it's, it's deep in the delta of a, of a massive marsh. And so it's, it's, the marsh is its safety. So in that way, it's a little bit like Venice was, you know, Venice was protected by the lagoon. It's a little bit uh, of the floating markets of Thailand. Um, it's a little bit uh, like this city uh, in China, Lijiang, where I live, which has all of these braided canals. Um, and it's a little bit like just the Amazon. Um, you know, it's all, all this stuff kind of braided together. But yeah, it would be, I would be insane not to say that the things that I saw and experienced in that year in Asia aren't all through this, you know, yeah. they're, they're all over, you know, just, uh, you know, the little, um, the little ornaments on, on the rooftops. And I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, the idea of, of shrines outside a house, you know, where people leave things there, there's all kinds of little, little grace notes that I probably wouldn't be in the book or definitely wouldn't be in the book if I hadn't spent a year living in Asia. Yeah, I understand. And, you know, that's that's also why when I first started reading the Emperor's Blades and also the Providence of Fire and that eventually getting to Scar's one, I kept on thinking, wow, this is this is quite different from a lot of fantasy books that I usually read. <laughs> this is quite different. And I, I think mean, it's brilliant. <laughs> I, I think it's an exciting time for fantasy because there's there's so much great fantasy yeah. that's being produced now. Um, and uh, like and a lot of it is now non-European. Um, some, of, some of the non-European stuff does seem to be like sort of historical fantasy that's really consciously, you know, Guy Gavriel Kay, for instance, he, he goes out to like tackle individual places, uh, right? Um, or Shelley Parker Chan, she has, you know, um, uh, she became the sun, which is like a Ming dynasty thing. Um, but uh, it's like, it's all over the place now, which I think is super exciting. Um, but I, I feel like uh, my hat is off to anybody who's willing to tackle truly historical fantasy because you need to know, you really need to know your stuff. If you're gonna, if you're gonna say this is, you know, whatever the Ming Dynasty, you better know a lot of shit about the Ming Dynasty. Someone will criticize you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love, one of my favorite kinds of, of uh, interaction that I have with fans is when um, people will come to me with an area of expertise. Like I've, I've chatted with veterinarians about the Ketrol or with, um, with you know, doctors about various wounds in my books. And, and uh, sometimes I'll get back in touch with those folks and I'll be like, I need something that's going to like slow this person down and slowly poison them, but not that, but I need them to die like over four days. <laughs> like what, <laughs> what, what can I do there? And so it's, it's great to be able to reach out to, to folks who, um, yeah, who have, who have all this knowledge that I don't have. And uh, the military training in the Emperor's Blades, I, th uh, I think it was the catch-all training that Va Valiant undertook. It, it's inspired by real life, right? That one? Well, yeah, I mean, I have like a, a just like, I'm, I was never in the military, I, I'm not about to be in the military, but I've, I've always had sort of an armchair fascination with, with military history and, you know, sort of modern special forces. And I like reading those books, like, you know, there's a whole batch of them. Um, Bravo 2-0 and, you know, all these stories about like British SAS or, or modern Navy SEALs. And I'm interested in the military side of it, but I'm particularly interested also just in like the, the brutality of the physical and emotional training. Yeah, you know, that's like, and, and I do like, I'm not in the military, but I do a lot of um, like long, long trail races and multi-day races. Um, and so it's, I'm able to sneak some of my own experiences of like, you know, whatever, exhaustion, hunger, dehydration, all of that into, in, into the training stuff um, for, whether it's for the Ketrol or the Shin monks who are always running around the mountains or the worthy in the Empire's Ruin who are like these gladiators. Yeah. You know, there's always, 
in any of my books, there's probably going to be like a, some training stuff, like the scene in, in Empire's Ruin where they're carrying the boat around through the, uh, through oh, the stand, God. you know. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's like, like Navy SEALs have to do that. They, they have these boats and they just lug the boats all, you know, up, down, around. Um, this is a little, you know, a little different fantasy equivalent. But yeah, I like I like all that stuff. And they're crazy because reading them actually makes me feel tired. I said, oh my God, these guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I like, you know, that's, again, again, that's a trope. Like the, the training montage is, yeah, is a very old trope. Know. But I love it. Anytime there's a training, even if I hate a movie with the training montage, I will be there for the training montage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what I want. I'd watch a whole movie of that. <laughs> Oh my god! And there is also the oh my! I, is this? I don't think this is a spoiler, but to keep it uh, to keep it big, there is a kill hauling scene in the Empire's Ruin. Did you? Oh yeah! Oh my god! That scene was insane. <laughs> that scene was, was insane. Did you uh, like do research on that? I did. Yeah. It turns out keel hauling was not as common a punishment as I thought it was, and I guess that all, that turns out because it was mostly because people died. <laughs> Um, that's so brutal no wonder <laughs> yeah I, they did they did do it to people um and uh so yeah i did i did a lot of research about that and i think yeah uh, the first time i see a kill hauling scene i think it was in the tv show i don't know if you watched this black sales oh people keep telling me to watch that no i haven't seen it yeah yeah there, there is a kill hauling scene uh, in that in that tv series and when when i read that i'm like oh my god help <laughs> This is yeah. I mean, just horrifying, right? Just uh, horrifying. Yeah, just totally. I mean, how you don't just die of fright when, when they're just hooking you up for that? I don't. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and that scene, you know, that scene used to happen. That scene originally happened much earlier in the book. Um, oh. Yeah, oh. So. How? Oh. Yeah. I know it didn't make any sense. I was like, what? It, it, it's amazing when you get things in their proper place. You're like. Why the hell was I ever trying to do it the other way? But until it all clicks, I, I for some reason thought, um, I think it was originally right after the scene with the throne ships, you know, the, the battle with the Manjari. Um, oh, oh, you put it there? Yeah. yeah, which didn't belong there. That was a dumb place for it. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> in terms of the emotional progression, I mean, it, it sort of made sense logically because this is a punishment for an action. Yeah, but yeah. in terms of the emotional progression of the character, yeah, yeah. Sense at all. It needs to be. It needs to be more climactic, right? Um, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, all kinds of the number of mistakes, Patrick. The number of mistakes I've made. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> until you're like, oh, obviously that needs to happen this way, or that you know that goes over there. Like, um, I mean, I was just having, just dealing with something like this in the book I'm writing now, um, and you know writing the second book right yeah yeah writing the writing the following book and and i just had this character who was inert just not interesting and i kept trying to write her the same way mm. except more i was like well i'll just double down on that and it was just not working and then finally i just scrapped that i was like no she needs to be this whole other way and and then and then once you get it right it just writes itself it goes so quickly ah. it's sort of like i recognize now that if i'm really struggling with something I, it's probably because i'm doing it wrong it's like, you know, so. And one of the other characters in The Empire's Win is Akil. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that Akil would appear in uh, The Empire's Win as a main character. I think he yeah. was in Empire's Blitz, but only for a while. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's not, he's, I mean, he's secondary, not super important. But I was always, I always wanted to write about him because I thought the idea of writing about somebody who was a criminal with a monastic background who was using the skills that he learned as a monk yeah. to excel in a criminal enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a fun, a fun idea. Um, Cause like, a lot of that stuff, like the shin mastery of emotion and, and recall, all of that is like useful potentially for a criminal, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, oh, I always wanted to write about him and I didn't know, I thought maybe I'll do a standalone or I'll do some, some short stories and then as I began to conceive of this book, I thought, no, there's actually a real role for him in this book that, mm -hmm. and, he, and he'll, have, he'll have a larger role, I think, in the second, in the one that I'm writing now. Oh, nice. I'm looking forward to that. And, yeah. you know, speaking of Shin Monks, uh, 
I very rarely see monks in epic fantasy. Very rarely. <laughs> Usually it's priests. Come on. <laughs> Usually it's priests. But and yeah. I was curious about your concept of Vanit, the state of emptiness that you wrote yeah. in, uh, in this series, sorry. Uh, yeah. Which is, uh, uh, let's say, partly inspired by the uh, Buddhists. Absolutely. Because, okay. because I'm Buddhist, right? I'm Buddhist. And uh, the main concept of, uh, one of the main concepts of Buddhists is to reach Nirvana. And to reach Nirvana, you have to kind of uh, distance yourself from any worldly desire, right? And yeah. the concept of Vainiyat is state of emptiness. And I think it's really interesting to see this in epic fantasy. So interesting to me. So interesting. What, what, what type of Buddhist are you, Patrick? Uh, uh, is there a lot? <laughs> I'm actually not sure about the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah there, there are several types, but I don't think uh, I ever knew which one I am because uh, usually it's very general here. Sure, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I taught... Um, when I Before writing, I was a high school teacher and I taught a course in world religions and comparative religion. And so that was obviously heavily informs all of the stuff with the Shin monks and, and all the religion, you know, the priests of Intara and um, the religion of Ira. So, yeah, I was I was drawing actively on a lot of real world religious traditions. And again, I, I, I'm really hesitant to say, well, the Shin monks, yeah, they're, they are uh, Buddhists because there are some differences. Uh, but but there's undeniably there's a, a very strong Buddhist and Taoist influence on the Shin monks. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So like you know the writer Shuang Tzu, which I'm I'm terrible at the pronunciations, but uh, you know a lot of the stuff about emptiness and like the, you know the scene where where they give Caden a rock for his bowl. Oh yeah. And he can't get any soup in it. That's like that's like straight up. I mean it's but it's both Buddhist. You know that's like. There's some like Zen parables like that. There's some Taoist stuff like that. I mean, I'm not, that's not me. That's just me drawing on this old, old, these old traditions. Um, uh -huh. And then of course, the, the way that it departs is that, um, well, it departs in a couple of ways from, from the real world. One is that there is a God of, of emptiness in my uh, life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, there's no, there's no God of emptiness in Buddhism. Um, and that blank God, of course, is tied to the, the Kenta, these magical gates that people can go through and, um, and into a whole pantheon that is separate from our real world pantheon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it diverges, but yeah, oh, it's, it's all, I mean, I, I was fascinated by, by all of that, um, all of that study of Buddhism and it's all, it's all in there for sure. It worked brilliantly, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, okay. yeah, and I mean, it's, it's so, I've really enjoyed, um, I've really enjoyed exploring religion in the world, you know, and there's a number of different religions um, there, you know, there's the Shin, but there's also the, the people of Dombang who worship the three, um, oh, yeah. right? They have a certain kind of religion and there's the priests of Ira who are vaguely Christian in that they're not monotheistic, obviously, but, and they don't believe in Jesus, they have their own world, but, um, <laughs> But they, but they are vaguely Christian in that they are pacifistic. Um, they're a missionary religion. Um, they, uh, yeah, they, 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 they just sort of embody some of those traits. You know, they have a lot of martyrs who've gone off to different places to proselytize and then, been killed. And so, it was kind of, it was sort of interesting to try and write a character Ruck in the Empire's Ruin, wow. who's, who's trying to live those values, um, but it's a real struggle for him both because of his background and because of his circumstances like it's yeah, totally. it's really hard to be christian if you're put in a gladiatorial arena right? <laughs> <I know. laughs> so often, so your options are kind of like be a martyr or yeah. or betray your faith and yeah. that was that was the the thing that i wanted him to face so, so good so good <laughs> so interesting but i also i you know i really like to you know, in a lot of fantasy novels, the the pantheon and the religious, the, the, the structure, the metaphysical structure of the world is set and known. So, uh -huh. you know, characters will say like, well, I, I'm a devotee of this god or that god or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of acknowledged like, okay, yep, yeah, that god does that, that god does that. And, you know, obviously in our world, there's massive amounts of, of confusion and disagreement. Um, even within a given religious tradition, there are different sects that, that disagree uh, you know, sometimes violently. I mean, yeah. you look at you know, you look at the wars in Europe between Protestants and Catholics. Um, 
um, you know, Shiite Sunni split and Islam. I mean, it's it's everywhere. And because, you know, while some people claim perfect knowledge, nobody actually know. You know, the gods don't come down and like do stuff that we see very often, right? And I wanted to have my characters in my world be confused about their religion too, right? Uh, so, yeah. so you know, Ruck is he's devoted to Ira, the goddess of love. He often feels as though he can. He, he can sense her moving in him and through him that he can see her presence manifested in the world, but he's not sure. Yeah. And it's all good. He just doesn't know. Right. Yeah, exactly. and, 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 you know, Adair in the original trilogy, she, so for people who haven't read it, she, she comes to be a prophet of the goddess of light because mm -hmm. of a, a series of miracles. And she herself, she's, she accepts the mantle of, of prophet, but she herself doesn't know. She's like, am I a prophet or, yeah. or am I? God. Like, I feel like I've heard this voice, but the voice wasn't super clear. And I got struck by lightning and didn't die. But like that happens to people sometimes. So is this a miracle or is it just what? And and so I, I've enjoyed having characters in an ambiguous relationship with their faith, yeah. rather than in a relationship of certitude of like, well, this I am I am the priest of this God or the monk of this God, and I just follow their precepts and Mm. You know, that's that. Um, because I yeah, you know, that's what you that's what I see in the world around me is people struggling with their faith. Yeah, I think there's a lot of conflict with religion in this world. <laughs> and uh I you have uh, these uh, background as teacher and also you know about this religion stuff and is becoming an author always something that you've always wanted to do, or is it because you've read, I don't know, inspired by uh, other fantasy books and then you decided suddenly to start writing? Well, I, before I was a teacher, I, you know, when I, in my undergrad and grad school years, I studied right. and wrote poetry. So I, I always knew I wanted to write. So I spent a long time writing poetry and reading poetry. And uh, I loved that. It was, it was great. It was great training. Um, but you can't make a living writing poetry. I mean, there's like, there's like three <laughs> people in the world who are making a living writing poetry right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, none them, and none of them are like the good poets right like all the good poets are not making a living um so yeah so i you know i went on to teach high school which was awesome i loved that job i got to teach a, a whole bunch of stuff um that where i learned you know that, that world religion stuff i didn't know anything about anything about that i just decided to teach that course and in the oh. course of teaching i learned all that um and the same with the whole you know same with world history and all this stuff but um but so I always, always had an interest in writing, always wanted to write. And then um, I was like, well, okay, so poetry is not gonna be lucrative, but why don't I write something that people do actually buy? Um, and I'd, I'd grown up reading fantasy, just devouring fantasy. And I thought, well, I could, I'm excited about that. And I feel like I have a, a pretty decent working knowledge of the field. So I can, I can contribute in a way that I'm not just gonna be reinventing the wheel. Like I, I kind of see stuff that I would like to do that I think is a little bit different maybe than what's been done before. And um, so I was excited, excited to do that and just did. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the poetry is still there in the background, but it, it metamorphosed into this other thing. Ah, uh, I didn't know that. It's so cool to know about this. <laughs> and, you know, I, I consider you as one of the authors that always keeps on growing with each book because as I said, Skullsworn was your best book before this one and The Empire's Ruin is your best book so far, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I'm thrilled to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you have a writing schedule for all this or do you just write whenever you can? Uh, I, I used to have a pretty strict schedule and now it's more haphazard. Um, I mean, the pandemic was a, a, was a, a kick, a kick in the face in that, like, you know, there were no camps for my son. There was no, at, like, there was no school for a while. So yeah. <laughs> they're just, I mean, in, in a way it was awesome because, you know, he's nine, he was like eight into nine and it was just an awesome time to like go mountain biking and go skiing and like be, spend time out in the woods, building trails and doing stuff. I wouldn't trade that. And I'm sure when I'm like, you know, 90 years old and on my deathbed, I'll be like, that was the right, that was like the right way to spend the time. But yeah. it did not lead to the the writing of a bunch of words, <laughs> you know? Um, and there was just like a lot of days where I was like, well, this is, this is, this day is going to kind of be a bust or, you know, right, right after he went to bed or, um, 
So uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping that once we get you know we're back kind of into into a real schedule. He's in camp again for the summer, and um, now I can feel like the normal rhythms coming back. Because for me, I don't know. I'm amazed and in awe of these writers who can like. They're like, oh, I have 10 minutes. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write like a paragraph. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like such a delicate flower. I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to get my coffee and I need to read back over, you know, the chapter that I was writing and get in the headspace. And like, by the time I start writing, I've been sitting there for like 45 minutes. <laughs> and if I don't do that, I end up with something that's like really disjointed and it's like, I don't know. I end up having to like go back and rewrite it anyway. So, yeah, I don't know. People do it, and I, my hat is off to them. But I'm not one of them. I need like these. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm a delicate flower. <laughs> so I'm. I'm grateful to have like sort of more full days again, where I can really immerse myself and get like just you know sink into the story and sink into the characters for like four or five, six hours at a time. That's that's I think how I get. Yeah. Stop. Hopefully, hopefully that day will come soon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think it's. I mean, it's basically here. Like in the U.S., we have like, and especially in Vermont where I am, the vaccination rate is at like eighty-five percent. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in Vermont now, there's like basically three cases a day, new cases, and um, yeah, that's, that's so good to hear. That's We're, I mean, very, very fortunate, and I'm very grateful. And so that means that, you know, camps are open for my son, and, and school is open full-time, you know, stuff like that. So that's huge for, for writing. But, you know, it really was a gift that year um, of spending just tons of time with him, like, out in the wild. <laughs> so it's just wow. great. It's good memories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and like nine is such a fun age because he's like a legit adventure companion now. You know, he's, you know, when, when you have like a three or four year old, you can still go out in the woods and do stuff, but it's, it's less stuff. And now, you know, <laughs> like, he's always in front of me and he's like dropping off stuff and like hitting these, you know, root drops and these rocks and he's like yelling over his shoulder at me like, did you hit it? Did you hit that? <laughs> I'm like, no, not that one. Look kind of big look kind of scary um so it's just awesome you know it's great it's great to be out with him now yeah and uh so uh, before we close this interview uh, it has been this interview has been well, almost an hour now and uh your books so far all of them takes place in the same world so yeah. let's say once you're done with ashes of the unhealed john suji will you be yeah. writing like uh like another standalone like skull swan or will <laughs> Will it be a completely new book in a new Something series? New, completely new, completely different. And I already know I've been plotting it out. Um, oh, I don't want to say anything about it, but it's going to be completely different. Yeah, so I'm excited for it. Uh, something entirely new, but that won't be for a couple of years, right? Because uh, yeah. these books are, are big and they take me a long time. Um, Dude, this, this is so massive. I think this is bigger than Last Mortal Born, right? It is. It's the longest thing I've written. But also check this out here. Look at... Look at um, this is the US version and the UK version side by side. Oh my God, <laughs> that's a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The US version is on like microfilm. I mean, the paper is so thin. Um, in the UK, they were just like, screw it. We're going to make a big damn book. But it is, I mean, it's legitimately long. I mean, it's, it's over 300,000 words, which is, um, you know, not the longest fantasies out there. Like some of George R. R. Martin's middle books are like, I think pushing 400. 400. Is, yeah, 400,000 words, but um, it's it's long. You get over 300, I mean, by comparison, Skullsworn I think is 135. Oh, wow. So This is almost three books. It's almost three books, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's that? This is the audio Oh, book. the audio, look at that. How many yeah. CDs is that? Look at that thing. This is 28 discs. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Wow. Yeah, 28 compact discs, 35 hours and 39 minutes of listening. <laughs> Get your money's worth. Get your money's worth there. <laughs> this is so cool, though. This is so cool. Yeah, we've, we, we did a thing we've never done before. There are three different narrators for that. Uh, one for each POV character. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Moira Quirk, Joe Jameson, and Oliver Cutbill. Oh, yeah. wow. This is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it was neat because, uh, you know, Brilliance, they're the audio publisher. They sent me um, recordings by a number of different, like sort of audition recordings by a number of different narrators um, and, oh. and reading the same passage. 
And so my son, I don't really listen to a lot of audiobooks, but my son listens to them all the time. So we just sat down, we listened and, and then had like this hour long discussion about like, well, which, which, which person for this character, which person for Gwenna, which person for Ruck? And it was, it was awesome. It was fun. Oh. fun. <laughs> and they're all super talented. Well, even the people that we didn't pick, it wasn't like they were bad. We just were like, are they the right fit for the character? You know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it, that was a fun process. So, so were you like in charge of choosing who's going to do the audiobook? No, uh, basically they, they narrow it down to a small field and then they're like, of these three people, which one do you want? Ah. Uh... You know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know the audiobook world that well. I don't know all the narrators and all the actors. Um, so yeah, they say like, you can choose from these, this very short list, <laughs> but I appreciate that. I mean, they don't have to do that. Right. Contractually, they could just say, we're doing this. I think, I don't know. I, I always forget what's in my contract. Yeah, because I, I think I think it is usually the case. Usually the case is like that. Usually, yeah, so, yeah, uh, maybe it is. Yeah, yeah, but it's fun. I mean, it's cool. It's nice to nice to be included. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking about included, do you uh, uh, take part in doing the cover art? Like, do do they ask your opinion? Yeah. So, well, uh, the UK, not as much. I mean, I'm just like less involved with everything in the UK because I'm in the US, right? Not because they're, they're not great people, but they just, you know. Um, but in the US, yeah, Rich usually, Rich Anderson, the guy who does these, the oh, artist. I, I love his artwork. He's one of my favorite artists. <laughs> and he usually does like a few sketches, a few mock-ups and says like, which, which vibe do you like of these three? And I'll say like, I like this vibe. And it's, it's in, in conjunction like with my agent, my editor, it's not just me, um, and with the art department. And then, I'll, but I'll say, I think this really captures the feel of the book. And then he'll do more detail on that. And he'll say like, am I basically getting it right? Like in this, he nailed it right away, except when his clothes in the, in the original version were much baggier. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, and I was like, I don't, I want, I want, that just is implausible for the Ketrol that she's got all this flapping fabric. Can we yeah. like, you know, streamline and, and he did. And so, yeah, I have, uh, I try not to abuse, I don't want to be like a, a prima donna author who's like, I want it a little bit like that, or a little bit like that. Like uh, I really respect Rich's artwork and, and, and I, and I respect the art department at Tor who knows better than I do what's going to move books. Right. Um, you could get, you could get very bogged down as an author in being like, you know, is this the right kind of sword for Gwenna to have? Is it too uh, long, or too short? Like really who gives a shit? Does it look cool? Does it look cool is the, is the question. And does it, does it generally emotionally capture the tone of the book and the character? That's what I'm, that's what I'm going for. And, and yeah, Rich has always been really, really generous in, in sort of including me to some degree in the process. So uh, I'm really excited. We've, we've already done the cover concept for the next book. We have, we, I can't tell you these things yet, but we have a title and I haven't seen the cover art, but I, I told him the scene that I want. Um, ah, I see, I and see. I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be really a cool, I oh, think yeah. it's gonna be a cool cover. There's a lot going on in it. And it's got, it's got a couple characters who have not yet appeared on a cover, but who have been around for a long time in the series, so. Ah, okay, okay. Because uh, all of your books, uh, maybe maybe not The Emperor's Blades, but The Providence of Fire, Last Mortal Born, Skull Sword, and The Empire's Wind, the US cover, yeah. is kind of like taking a scene from the book into the yeah, cover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I love and that, that. Every time I reach that scene, I'm like, oh, this is the scene from the cover art. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. And, and that's usually that's usually our jumping off point is that my editor will say, hey, can you give us a cover concept scene? Like, what do you think would work well? And uh, either I get one or one or a couple, you know, and then we go from there. Uh, wow. <laughs> I love hearing yeah. about this stuff <laughs> because, uh, I mean, come on. As I said, you're one of my favorite writers and Richard Anderson is one of my favorite artists. It's like a yeah. comedy. <laughs> you know? I, I mean, just totally lucked out, right? I mean, just as a debut author, they were like, we're going to get this guy, Rich Anderson. Do you like, like, look at his website and tell us if you hate it. And I was like, are you kidding? It's amazing. It was like, perfect. Thank you so much. Yes, please get him. <laughs> and cover art is really important, especially if you're new authors. It's incredibly, so, yeah. incredibly important. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, I've taken enough of your of your time, Brian. So last question: uh, When can we expect the second book? And congratulations on the release of the Empire's Ruin. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, the second book will be 
don't think we have a release date, but it'll be next year sometime. You know, I'm going to finish writing it uh, like this fall and then it'll probably be, you know, it takes about a year. So probably, you know, maybe a little bit more than a year after Empire's Ruin. It's not what? ideal. I mean, I would like to release books like every nine months or every every year, but they're just... I'm so jealous of people who write books that are, you know, 150,000 words. It's like I could write twice as many books. Yeah. Right? It costs the same amount of money. <laughs> I can sell twice as many books, but for some stupid reason, they keep writing these monstrous books, which just take longer. So yeah, it'll be it'll be next year sometime. I mean, I've made good progress on it. I'm excited. It's not like The Empire's Ruin was when I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing and I'm going, I'm chasing down. Like this, is, this I feel pretty confident about where it's going. Um, you know, it's just, there's a lot of words and you want to get it right. So yeah, just working my way through it. Uh, but there, anyway, there's no, uh, for me anyway, uh, it's no pressure really. I mean, if you feel like it needs more time, you should do it. <laughs> I always I mean, there's, do. So, there's so many great books out there now. It's not like, I know. You know, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no shortage. Yeah. So just take your time. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Well, that's it for today's interview. I just want to say thank you so much, Brian, for visiting this channel. The Empire's Ruin uh, is out now. This video will be posted on the 6th of July. So that's the release date of the US. And two days from now, uh, the UK will be out as well. And yeah, thank you so much, Brian, for visiting this channel. Thank you, Patrick. This was awesome. Such a great chat. I appreciate being on. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>